Hey everyone, I'm gonna do a short video today um, focused on some arguments presented by a uh, somewhat popular atheist on YouTube. Um, got a fairly big following, um, 220,000 subscribers or so, and uh, Morgue Official. And so he come out with this video that says that he has 100% proof that God cannot exist. Says it's an impossibility. And so I'm going to go over some of these arguments and kind of expound on them and uh, kind of help situate some issues there. Some of the things that he proposes and uh, how making such drastic claims as proving the non-existence of God, um, those are rather big claims to be making. And you need substantial uh, evidence to back up your claims, um, which he presents some evidence as well as some assumptions. We're going to go over that real quick. So first thing I want to look at is that he believes that, well, one thing, it's not empirical evidence. It's through logic and reason, although he does present empirical evidence throughout the video. Um, his, one of the, the first thing that he starts out with is trying to come to a logical conclusion. You have premise one, premise two, and then the conclusion. So, to use, for an example, he used, uh, for premise one, he said, all humans are mortal. And then for premise two, he said, Socrates is human. And for the conclusion, therefore, Socrates is mortal. And he said, that proves that Socrates is mortal. And so that's how you come to a logical conclusion, a proof, so to speak. But the problem with that is in, uh, you know, scientific immunity, you understand that in order for something to be absolute, you have to have all the pieces of evidence in order to come to the proper conclusion. And uh, so just looking at this, just for just the example he used, stating that all humans are mortal is a general conclusion, but it's still an assumption overall, uh, scientifically speaking, because in order to have that to be an absolute truth, you would have to gather up all the humans on the face of the earth and throughout the course of history to make sure that there were no immortal humans. Um, so that's the only way that that could be 100% proven and then that would lead to the 100% proven uh, conclusion. Um, that's how you truly prove something. So that was already a mistake on his part uh, right there. That comes to a general conclusion, but it's not a proven conclusion entirely. Um, so, generalized conclusion. But we'll go ahead and look at his arguments. Uh, a couple of them are age-old arguments. So, first we'll look at, he said there's three premises by which uh, you could, um, that constitute uh, the God of the Bible. Three attributes. That is, he's all-loving, all-powerful, and uh, all-knowing. And if one of these were to be extracted, then he, it's an impossibility that the God of the Bible could exist. So the first argument he used was that God's all loving, but how can he be all loving if he um, allows people to go to hell? So that's a reprehensible act of God that he allows people to go to hell. And he talks about even the choice thing, because a lot of people are like, well, he gives us free will. And he said, well, you, so you create somebody with free will and then you allow them to go to hell. How reprehensible is that? So, and I mean, the guy's pretty smart. I'm not saying he's not smart. He has some very good arguments and some good information, uh, scientifically speaking, especially later on when I get into his last argument of wave frequencies. But um, his conceptualization, first off, of that of love is incorrect and we have that problem nowadays because we we conceive love to mean only that of, of a caring nature um, but we also get that idea wrong we, we always look at it simply as an emotion and something that you know is enrapturing and, and loving you know uh, soft and benign but we don't understand that love is also a judge um, we do it to ourselves or we do it to other people. We do it to our children and for parents. You love somebody, you seek to correct their actions. 
And God, you want the best for them. You want the best life for them. And you want them to be the best that they can be. Well, in order to do that, you're constantly critiquing and you're trying to help. You do it to yourself as well. well I want to be in the best shape. So you're, you're critiquing yourself and judging yourself, making sure that you're disciplining yourself, make sure that you get to that optimal position that you're wanting to be in. Um, that optimal conceptualization in order to get there towards the ideal. That's love though. You, you wouldn't do that to somebody you don't love. Uh, you would just torture them. You know, you wouldn't correct them. You wouldn't help them to become the best that they are. And that's love and action as well. It can be comforting and it can be judgmental at the same time. That, you know, the disciplinary action of love itself to guide us towards the ideal. And in the Christian life, that's how it works as well. As we strive to become the best, the best that we can be and towards the, the ideal of Christ, the character, uh, characteristics that constitute Christ. And that uh, that's an act of transformation, but it takes, that's out of love of us wanting to please the Lord and become the best that we can for him, bring him most glory. Uh, love acts as a judge as well as it acts um, in a caring uh, nature as well, encouraging. And, uh, so that is, that's the problem. Uh, one of the problems with his argument being presented there, that you have to get into your conception of love, correct. Uh, so on the same token, He's essentially stating there should be no repercussions of actions, but yet that's embedded in nature. And I mean, as scientific as he is, he should understand that. Every action has a consequence, whether good or bad. We had that at the beginning with Adam and Eve. They show, and they represent humanity as whole. And the choice between tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. When you choose a tree of life, you're, you're working, you're, Acting out and the consequences will lead you to a good conclusion. If you act out the bad choice, it's going to lead you to the bad conclusion. Um, so we have that same choice today. All of us as human beings have that same choice today with the choice of tree of life, which is represented as God, symbolic of God, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is that of self. Uh, we're wanting to play the God role. And so we cannot save ourselves. We're finite, we're weak. And, you know, we, it takes us to humble ourselves and to seek God instead in order for us to come to the uh, proper conclusion, the ultimate good um, consequence, outcome. Um, God loved us and he created us to have a relationship with us. And it's our duty to return that love and to establish that relationship with him. And that way we wake up from this dream reality we're in, in heaven, one day with the Lord forever that we, you know, did relate and continue on that relationship in a more personal way in a, uh, you know, person to person basis, face to face basis. But if we choose to go the other direction, we're setting ourselves up for failure and we're playing the God role. Well, I can do it myself. Well, once you do that, you put yourself, you are making yourself out as God and therefore you deserve the same punishment as the other ones that played God, that is Lucifer and uh, the demons and things. You're, you're playing the same, so you deserve the same punishment. You're making yourself God. Therefore, you deserve the punishment of a God, and that is the eternal fire of hell. So you have the choice. You can humble yourself and return the love that God you know, uh, has already given you from him, return that love and establish a loving relationship with him, you know, and the reason we're here in the first place is because of the bad choice we already made. So it's our duty here to establish that relationship, return that love to him, and to ultimately be with him forever. Not including the fact that God loves us so much that he respects our choice to not choose him, to not choose to love him, to not establish that relationship, and to choose our own way. Even though it hurts him and it kills him, and he doesn't want us to go hell, absolutely. But he respects that choice. That's how much he loves us. Okay, you don't want to be with me. You don't. You don't want to be. Uh, you don't want to love me. You don't want to uh, establish that relationship with me. I'm not going to sit there and and um, transgress your choice and force you to be with me eternally if you don't love me in the first place. I'm going to allow you to choose your own way and and whatever choice it is. That's the consequence. It's not that God puts us in hell. We actually choose and take ourselves to hell ourselves. 
So God loves us so much to respect our decisions. And he loved us so much. He created us and gave us free will. That way we could choose him and choose to love him back just as he loves us and to establish that relationship with him and be with him forever. So, um, and then he also uses the argument for Noah's flood and uh, as, you know, evil that occurs here and how he flooded the world and killed innocent lives and so on and so on. God chooses however we're going to end up dying. You have to understand that. Whether it be cancer, whether it be natural death, whether it be gunshots, whether it be, it doesn't matter, but we're going to die some, one form or another, we're going to die. And as Paul says, it's better to be with the Lord than it is to be present in this body. So we live in a dream reality. We put ourselves in this fallen state with our choices at the beginning. And so we have to deal with these negative consequences. God didn't want us to go this direction, but we chose to go this direction. So we have to deal with things as they are. He hates seeing that people die and stuff. He doesn't like that. And it kills them. It hurts them that that happens. But we have to look at it in the positive manner too, the eternal perspective, his perspective, that now those people are with him eternally. The ones that are quote unquote innocent, as he was talking about, the babies and children, things like that. They're, they're no longer having to deal with the pain and suffrage of this world. And uh, especially in Noah's time where everybody was reprehensible as it is, and they grow up in that environment and become reprehensible themselves. Instead, they're taken and they're with the Lord forever in the place that we so desire to be. Now, I include in the fact that we have to understand this is but a dream reality. And it says that once we are transported into the higher dimensional realm with the Lord, that the former things are forgotten, just like a dream. We experience pain in dreams. Uh, some people experience death in dreams. And then they wake up in the comfort of their homes. And it's like, that's the, same, that's the same way that this life works, as we can tell from Scripture. And we can even see that in scientific evidence as well, how this universe is not, a, a, but a, a dream reality, a simulation, uh, so to speak. And that we'll wake up and all those former painful things, all these horrible things that happen will banish from our memories and we'll wake up in this wonderful place in the presence of the Lord who we've been, whom we have established a relationship with and that loves us and we love him and we're with him forever and with other loved ones forever. You know, just a paradise state of, um, you know, unbelievable proportions. So that deals with the loving issue. Now we can look at uh, the powerful, all powerful issue. You say it can't be all powerful. He uses the age old argument of can God create a stone that's so big that he can't even lift it? If he can, he's not all powerful. And if he can't, he's not all powerful. Therefore, it's logically, um, you can come to the logical conclusion that God cannot exist. There's just no way, you know, it's according to the Bible stakes. But you have to understand that logic is a, is a part of God's nature. And so he's not going to, uh, well, first off, he, I'm sorry, I, I messed up there. He also states the same thing, like can God create a square circle or can he make two plus two equal five? And so therefore, if, if he can't, that means that, you know, uh, the laws of logic and stuff are more powerful than him or that logic is contained within him. And that's more the proper conclusion. Uh, God is the source of all wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And so in him, he is, it, logic flows from him. And so on the, onto the stone deal right quick, God is spirit and he has no perimeters. He's dimensionless. And so therefore he's not creating a stone so big he can't lift is an impossibility, a logical Impossibility. He's not going to transgress his own logic because he's not a physical form. He's spirit. And so therefore it's dimensionless. It's, it's impossible to do that. And so, well, it's not all powerful. It's like, no, he's powerful within. He's not going to transgress his own nature by making a square circle or two plus two equals five. Logic flows from him. That is a part of his very nature. And so he goes on and says that, that really it's easier, it's better to conclude that, that mathematical laws are God. And that's what constitutes our universe through wave frequencies on the quantum level. And that's true in part. He said that, so therefore it's unconscious mathematical laws that are the creator 
uh, that's the creator of the universe and, and that's God essentially. And he says that uh, you can come up with this conclusion because of Occam's razor, where it's the most simplest explanation is more than likely the correct option. And yet at the same time, he is making the assumption that that, that is always true, that Occam's razor is always true. That's a general guideline. That is not always true. That's an assumption that he says that existence always chooses the simplest route. That's not true at all because we can even see that in evolution itself. It went from simpler forms up to the most complex forms that there are. We have a consciousness. So that brings me to the next deal. And he talks about the wave frequencies, that they're dimensionless and that the math is within them and that's really the creator. And we see that on the quantum level. You see the wave particle duality of subatomic particles. And in order to... Um, activate those you need a conscious observer uh, to activate uh, the universe and i've said it before uh, albert einstein hated this idea because um, he didn't like the thought that if he's not looking at the moon it wasn't really there and so you need some conscious observer to uh, to activate the universe and it is true we figured that out uh, through the um, uh, the slip um, uh, experiment. Now I'm trying to think. I done lost my train of thought on that, but a double slit experiment where the particles shot through, and when the um, when the observer observed the particle, it was a particle. But when he wasn't looking at it, it was a wave. And so it's almost as though the subatomic particles have consciousness, which would mean the the wave. Uh, nature that he's speaking of has a consciousness and he specifically says well no it doesn't it's unconscious and he and he makes such a drastic claim stating that see uh we can have all we need is unconscious mathematical laws to create the universe and it's like that's an assumption again an assumption you don't know that to be true and and he's making these drastic claims of proving god non-existence um and he's essentially uh uh describing God when he talks about dimensionless mathematic, uh, mathematical laws and things. And it's like, you're talking about an intelligent design. An intelligent design needs intelligence behind it. There's a supreme intelligence. And it takes, a con uh, it takes consciousness to, for us, it takes consciousness to activate the particles, to activate the universe. Therefore, it takes a higher consciousness to create the, the universe. Um, it logically follows, if you think about it for, uh, for a second, the wave frequencies, the particles and stuff are conscious. It takes us to look at them and, and they know whether or not we're actually looking at them. It's so bizarre. They tested that with the double slit experiment, uh, looking at the uh, initial experiment was done by looking before the slits and they watched it. And when they weren't looking, it would come out a wave and it would do the deal. Um, but it would come out. And as soon as they weren't looking at it, it would become a wave. Well, they went ahead and done it on the backside. And they said that it would come out a wave. It would realize that we were watching, that they were watching it. And as though it went back in time and come out a particle. I mean, that's how bizarre and complex our universe is. It's so insanely intelligent, uh, intelligently designed. Uh, but as I said, it takes a conscious observer to activate the universe, to make the universe manifest itself as reality, as what we see, the tangible uh, physical goods that we have and, and nature and, and so forth and so forth. It takes a conscious observer. The universe seems to be conscious. It seems as though the universe was consciously designed for the emergence of conscious beings to activate the universe. So there's a consciousness behind it. That is God, the God of the Bible, who created the universe for us to inhabit, for a, a conscious observer to even be able to activate the universe into existence. So it was purposely designed, and that follows through as a logical conclusion. It was purposely designed for conscious observers. And unconscious mathematical uh, wave frequencies are not going to do that. And as I said, you know, think about it, mathematical laws is all we need. Well. Who come up with those laws? Who designed those laws? How do those laws come into existence? You're making too many assumptions on things. So um, that's how I can break those down. I uh, hope this helps. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned some things. Um, thank you for watching. Uh, please like and share. 
And if you'd like to donate to my ministry work, you can uh, through the link in the description, uh, through PayPal, uh, as well as check out my books on the link in the description. It takes you to my Amazon author page to all my books. Uh, so thank you all again for watching. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Stay safe out there. God bless.